the title of the show, Complexity and Convention, represents this third exhibition showing projects which established a new standard by which all architects would practice with digital technology. Um, the, the projects collected here are not as experimental writing their own software. This is actually the moment that commercial software was readily available and it really changed the way architects both designed and the way they constructed. And the, the show ties together a series of themes uh, by which all of the projects are organized. In this third exhibition, we complete the list of 25 projects which make up the core of the digital archive at the CCA. And as was the case with the other two exhibitions, we look at this as a tool. It's the first step into the archive where we begin to open up uh, fragments of the digital archives from the architects. We compare it with physical materials like drawings, uh, models, studies and we start to organize the collection in terms of both types of materials, types of software, and concerns that are common to all of the architects. Instead of exhibiting each project individually in the show, we've taken all the projects apart and looked at them on the basis of five themes. The first theme is dedicated to the gallery we're standing in now, which is High Fidelity 3D. What you see here is stacks and stacks of drawings. If previously an architect might have done 100 drawings for a project, here in the exhibition, you see architects are doing thousands of drawings for projects. That's because they now, for the first time, have in one place a high fidelity 3D model from which they can get basic information about the site, basic information about structural grids and measurements, all the way down to small details, all in one place. And they can use that asset to generate the two-dimensional drawings. So instead of working from the big scale down to the detail, the architects were able to work back and forth across scales, and they were able to coordinate things in a different kind of a way. So in this room, we show a few themes that came from this high-fidelity 3D. First, they're generating drawings now not as two-dimensional documents, but as slices or windows into a large three-dimensional data file. We also are showing that because they have that three-dimensional data, the architects can now bypass the contractor and start to work directly with fabricators and manufacturers. So they're talking to the machines that are making building components and jumping across what would have been a middle person, which is the contractor or fabricator. Also what you see going on is instead of building models uh, conventionally from drawings, people are beginning to build models directly from 3D files. And so there's a, a section that's showing 3D printing, um, and as well, that's a full-scale template of the Kutner loft where the architects are also providing two-dimensional information but again bypassing the contractor in order to do so. So here you really see how uh, having all the information in one 3D file really changes the way architects talk to their collaborators and the builders and changes a little bit the way documents are made for construction. So now we're in gallery two which is dedicated to topology and topography. Now these are two different themes put together. So in this room you start to see architects working with a new language of these complex curved surfaces. They do it in a variety of ways. The first theme is dedicated to rethinking the shape and massing of buildings on their sites. So, for example, the studies here of Coop Himmelblau for the BMW World, uh, the Iskivla Music Center by Ocean North, these are all looking at a new language of surfaces and trying to find a new expression for the building mass and volume. And those are done with models, with digital files. We have a whole variety of media. What's key is that there was a new shape, grammar, and language coming along with the digital technology.
Also with this new language of geometric surfaces came continuities between elements. And the architects began to look at what we call an ergonomics of continuity. So with, for example, the Kutner loft, uh, with water flux, floors, walls, and ceilings were now defined instead of with three surfaces with one curvilinear surface. And that continuity and curvilinearity suggested new ways of people occupying the space. And we also then have this section devoted to that we call ergonomics. One of the interesting things about these topologies is they're very difficult to represent in two-dimensional drawings. They work in 3D space. They don't work so well in 2D space. So what we saw a lot of the architects using were the tools of landscape architecture. And even in the case of Riser Umamoto with the Kansai Diet Library, Nanako is a landscape architect, Jesse is an architect. They work together to find a new way of representing these complex curvatures in plan and in section. Likewise, in the Fino Center, you see these beautiful plans which are representing contour cuts and levels the same way a landscape architect would. This use of landscape techniques to think about the interiors of buildings also led to new continuities between the ground and the building, new continuities between sloped landscape surfaces you would associate with parks and the interior of buildings, and a kind of new fusion of infrastructure and buildings that we saw kind of in the late 1990s very prevalently. And so this area of the gallery is dedicated to that conversation with landscape and infrastructure. One of the best examples of that conversation between landscape and infrastructure is the Yokohama Port Terminal by Foreign Office Architects, as well as the Erasmus Bridge by UN Studio. Um, and these projects show up both in structure, because they were infrastructure projects, as well as in the topography gallery, because of that continuity they try to achieve with landscape. So instead of a piece of infrastructure being a monument, they really were looking at it as part of a groundwork and an urban fabric. Now we're in the third gallery, which is dedicated to photorealism. One of the things that digital technology brought was rendering. And that means not looking at lines on a screen anymore, but being able to look at surfaces, which would be hiding lines behind and showing space. They were looking at textures, where you'd have a library of materials that came with the software to study materials and texture, with lighting, which would allow you to shade, and also even project shadows. So on the architect's screen, they were looking at a plan view, two side views, and all of a sudden a perspective view. And this ability to design in perspective, to be able to design with shading and lighting and materials, changed a little bit the way things were conceived. So this gallery is devoted not so much to making things look realistic, but to the change in the way architects were thinking about space, material, and light in a digital environment. There were various responses to this new set of digital tools. Some of the architects tried to simulate what they were looking for in the building as closely as possible. So in the example, say, of Neil Denari's Gallery Ma, when we were going through the materials, it wasn't always clear what was a photograph and what was a screenshot or a rendering. As well, it led Neil Denari to looking at augmented reality with a Sony device, which would allow him to project virtual material into the gallery. And it got him thinking even about soundtracks and, and the sound and texture of the space. So that was an attempt to really go as much towards a high fidelity representation as possible. In the Kutner loft, materials were chosen, like glossy coated fiberglass, which looked a lot like the renderings that we're capable of doing in the 1990s. So the architecture began to look a little bit like the renderings. Other architects like Wolf Pricks hired Hollywood special effects and filmmaking companies to produce films which combined enormous physical models with digital content 
And suddenly you saw in the finished buildings digital projections and digital materials integrated into surfaces because of this software visualization that they began with. Other architects tried to merge previous methods of representation with these new digital technologies, like Zaha Hadid and Patrick Schumacher with the Fino Center beginning to use paint as a rendering surface over top of digital prints and digitally generated projections of uh, perspectives. So there isn't one photorealism as there might be in Hollywood. Here with the architects, they were searching for the right language to visualize their work, and it was having an effect on the built work as well as the drawings, renderings, and films they were producing on the way to getting to the built work. In some cases, there was even a reaction to these material libraries and textures, as you can see with Scott Cohen's I-Beam Museum, where instead of having floors, walls, and ceilings, all different textures and different materials, the response was to study the light, the light and shadow. It wasn't as if everyone was moving towards materials. Some people's reaction was actually to focus only on certain aspects of photorealism, like the ability to have soft lighting effects. In this show, we don't foreground it all the time, but there were a lot of discussions with things outside of architecture. In the last galleries, it might have been with how things were fabricated or manufactured. Here in photorealism, there were many conversations going on with the special effects industry and with the media industry. For example, Neil Denari was working with J.J. Abrams and he was working with silicon graphics computers which were made for high quality visualizations in Hollywood while he was doing Gallery Ma. With BMW World, Wolf Pricks was working with Imaginary Forces and Scott Cohen was working uh, with KD Labs and people like that who were going on to, to work in the Hollywood film industry like Joseph Kaczynski who directed uh, Tron and Oblivion. So there were all kinds of connections going on here between architects and the film industry as well to try to get the right approach to using rendering and visualization. So in this room, this is all about the CCA and the project of digital archaeology. These are the materials that the museum is working with and trying to bring to life and give access to scholars. I know it looks like there's not a whole lot here, but in this room we have the e-publications, which contain the transcripts of the interviews with all of the architects and collaborators. We have the data on the individual projects, which people can kind of understand the full scope of a project for the first time. We have interviews with the architects where you can play the sounds of the architects talking about their projects and digital technology. And here we have three models. What you don't see here is a physical model is in fact a three-dimensional digital model. So here we're going to look at the I-Beam Museum. You point it at the table. It builds a map. And now we have a three-dimensional file that we can move around. And we can also go inside the building and have a look at the interior. So it gives you a new access to the three-dimensional files. For a visitor, very similar to the way an architect might be spinning a file on their screen, but it lets you look at that digital content at a variety of scales and from a variety of perspectives. So this allows us to show a scholar all of the different three-dimensional files that were used in the design process, and it lets them interact with them in a different way than they would with one of the physical models. It's also a little bit better than looking at something on a screen, and is a little bit more intuitive than other ways of doing it. So this room is really about new ways of exhibiting and accessing digital content and digital materials in its native format. So in this fifth gallery, we're dedicating the theme to data. One of the things that was amazing to architects at the time period is all of the invisible and inaccessible information 
could be visualized, because it could be visualized, people could start to design to it and come up with all kinds of new solutions. So in this room, we try to show the largest possible range of data we could. And we represent a lot of the projects here in collaboration with engineers and consultants, but engineers and consultants who are not being given a design and being asked to engineer it, but engineers playing a different role where they were really partners at the inception of the design or early in the process because they were providing visual information. So here for Yokohama Port Terminal, you see lighting studies of different light levels on the different floors of the building. So the amount of lighting could be visualized so that the ceiling plan could become designed and animated in a different way, thinking about light. On the right side of the gallery, we have primarily what's called finite element analysis, or FEA, of structure. So instead of designing columns and beams the way an architect normally would, and then asking an engineer to tell them how big they needed to be, here architects were providing 3D files to engineers, and the engineers were analyzing the loads and giving the architects back information about where the stresses were so they could begin to locate structure where there was more stress or eliminate structure where they didn't have as much stress. So this kind of visual representation of structure was very important to a lot of the projects. And as you'll see in the next gallery, led a lot of architects to premiate structure, to use structure as a primary mode of expression for their buildings. Um, and there's a range of things from the Erasmus Bridge, which is pretty much just a structure, except where it meets the ground, uh, through the, the Villa Nerves, which is a house, water flux, and then the Chemnitz Stadium. All of these projects ended up uh, putting a lot of weight, um, visual, visual emphasis on structure. Behind me, you see uh, Devin Weiser and Peter Testa's carbon tower which was designed not by modeling or drawing, but actually by writing an algorithm or a script. So in some cases, the ability to visualize data was done in writing an algorithm which could produce a script. And this is an interactive uh, display where a visitor could walk up and a connect device lets you run that script. So you can see that's not an animation, that's actually a piece of mathematics that's generating the geometry dynamically. On the left side of the gallery, we're focusing on the other things than structure, uh, light studies. Instead of uh, building a model and putting a light on it, you could have a digital sun that would move through the seasons and you could see the effect of light on a building and make decisions about the massing of a building and the openings of the building, as you do with Villa Nerves. You could use wind simulation to see how flow would work through the building both wind on the exterior of the building, but also heating and cooling as it would move through the building dynamically. That's with BMW World. Collision detection was a very interesting phenomenon. So you could load three-dimensional geometry from your mechanical engineers, your structural engineers, your architect. Digitally, you would be able to find where two things occupied the same place, and you could eliminate those kinds of collisions it makes a lot of this work very buildable at affordable budgets and on normal time frames, that the computer was doing that work to avoid mistakes. Um, and then finally, logistics played a role, where you saw architects now thinking about how building materials would get to the site, in what sequence you would build a building, and how things would fit together. That was all being animated in the computer using 3D dimensions and uh, logistical planning. One of the things that came out of looking at data like this is instead of thinking about buildings as static and inert, instead of thinking about structure as simply vertical and horizontal, you saw architects looking at simulations, uh, looking at stresses as they would move across a surface, and the language of the architecture responded to these forces and flows so that concepts of structure, concepts of sunlight, they all became much more complicated and richer 
because these tools allow the architects to visualize with more creativity and also more technical intelligence than they would have been able to do otherwise. I suppose the last thing to be said about this data room, this was all very new. This wasn't possible on an architect's desktop until the 1990s, but all of this now is standard practice. In some cases, you might have needed a slightly exotic piece of hardware or software to do this, but now you can do finite element analysis, you can do heat flow, you can do wind studies, solar studies, all with a $100 commercial piece of software. So this is now standard practice in the field, but just 10 years ago, this was on the cutting edge. So here we are in the last gallery, and for me, this is where both complexity and convention come into play. And that's why we saved this gallery for last. Uh, we call the theme here structure and cladding. And it's the place where you start to see complexity in primarily two ways. The first type of complexity is that no two parts of these buildings tend to be the same. Before you had a digital tool to control complexity, from the architect's point of view, it was very handy to make a lot of things exactly the same. For manufacturing, steel makers, glass makers, ceramic panel makers, they don't ever really do anything the same two times because every building is different. So for one building, they'll do a thousand things the same, start over, do another building with a thousand things different. What these architects discovered is if the architects could handle every element being different, the industry was already ready for that. So very rapidly, you see all of these projects getting built where every piece of steel, every piece of cladding, every window, they're all unique. It's important to say most, almost all of these projects, with maybe one exception, are average budgets, very accelerated schedules, not special clients. These are all typical buildings with typical budgets on typical schedules. This wasn't more expensive. When someone that doesn't know about architecture looks at this, they say, these buildings look complicated, they must be expensive, but they don't have any facts to back that up. The facts of all of this is these architects were building on conventional budgets very unconventional structures, and it was because of their use of digital tools. So this first kind of complexity is a complexity of different elements, where elements would all be a similar type, but each one might be a little bit different in dimension or shape. The other type of complexity is instead of having hierarchies of building systems, like primary structure, then the structure which you hang the cladding on, and then the cladding, these architects were putting all those things together and starting to use the cladding as structure, starting to use the, the primary frame for making apertures. So you saw another kind of complexity, which is building systems were getting integrated. Uh, Patrick Schumacher calls this phenomenon parametricism, where from the largest to the smallest piece, could be mathematically and algorithmically related so that things would start to lose their hierarchy and merge together into more complex systems. So here we see it mostly in the structure and cladding of buildings, so that's why we decided to focus on that. And you can see different examples of it from, let's say, the complex shell structures of some of the projects in steel to the perforated concrete structures where every aperture and element was unique, to the woven structures where the core, the envelope, and the, the floors were all integrated into one single monolithic system, and as well as the drawings and, and 3D data that shows that, we have even some samples from full-scale samples where you can see how elements were made differently by approaching different ways of molding them. For example, here, 
to details of the structure and envelope and cladding uh, in model studies above. So here you can see examples other than the 3D data and the drawings and renderings. We also have examples of full-scale elements and how they were made uniquely, as is the case with the pieces on the bottom shelf. We have models showing the integration of primary structure and building skin. And we even have the model of the Witt Art Center by Office Da, which shows a new complex approach to familiar materials. So here, the brick stacking and patterning was looked at where a conventional element like a brick was using digital technology to produce complex curves and complex apertures simply by the way it was stacked in a very accurate, very algorithmically generated or controlled way. So here really is, for me, the kind of summation of where these complex approaches came from. And again, the convention part of this is this is now standard practice. So what was being done by the architects for buildings of an average cost and time now has become the industry standard. So you see these kinds of approaches even in commercial practices, which are not very innovative. It's been adopted into the field very rapidly.